Hello again, and uh, welcome back to the uh, Haystack Conference, guesting as part of Berlin Buzzwords this year. I hope you've had a fantastic week so far. Um, it looks sadly like we're coming to the end of, uh, of our conference, but it's been a great uh, few days. Um, so I'm Charlie Hull from Open Source Connections, for those who don't know me. And this is, as I said, a talk presented by the Haystack Conference series. We focus on search and relevance and uh, a, a way of sharing great talks on search and relevance of the community. Uh, currently, we're running the Haystack Live meetup every few weeks, uh, featuring lots of talks on search and relevance. Um, and later this year, we're hoping to run physical conferences again. So keep an eye on the Haystack website. I'll post a link into the chat and we'll have news on that as soon as we know it. Uh, also, do join the relevant Slack group. I'll put a link in for that, where there's lots of great folks hanging out talking about search and relevance. So today's main event, solar elastic search. Elastic search or solar? What's this Vesper engine that's just turned up? Is it better than both of them or either of them? Are they all the same? Does it really matter? These are all common questions that we have uh, put to us at Open Source Connections. Uh, and as any search engineer will tell you, they come up again and again, which will be the right search engine for you. So how do you choose what will be the best search engine for you and your project? Well, today we brought together three search experts to help, and we're going to take your questions today uh, and try and bring some clarity to this debate. This is actually the second time we've done this debate. We did it earlier this year um, as part of Haystack Live, and it was hugely popular. But uh, in no way did we answer all the questions there might possibly be and also to give some of you who weren't there a chance to ask them today. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask all of our panel to give a brief pitch for their favorite engine, and then we'll take questions. But uh, as they do that, do think of your questions um, around Solar, Elasticsearch, or Vespa, and drop them in using the questions tab, which is just to the right of your, uh, your screen today. Uh, do start submitting them now and thinking about them now. So firstly, I'd like to introduce our expert panel. We have Josh Devins, uh, who began working in search at SoundCloud before joining Elastic, where he's a senior engineer working on machine learning. Joe Christian Bergham has worked in search since the days of fast search and transfer and is now a senior print search principal engineer at Verizon working on Vespa. Ansham Gupta has worked for Lucidworks at IBM uh, on the Watson project and is now at Apple. Uh, but he's also a solar committer and on the solar project management committee or PMC. So firstly, thank you all three of you uh, for agreeing to do this again. And uh, we're very much looking forward to today. We uh, had a quick calculation in uh, the irrelevant Slack before we started this. And we reckon between the four of us, we've got around 65 years of collective experience of search. Um, so I think you'll agree that's an awesome total. Well, slightly scary total. It doesn't all reside with one of us <laughs> or anything like that. We're all equally youthful and beautiful. So, um, but do get your hard questions ready. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing them. Um, so um, I'm first, I'm gonna ask us everyone in, in turn to give a quick pitch to why they think their favorite search engine is the best choice for you. And I will say that last time we did this, everyone was far too nice about the other people in the room. So a little bit of needling, a little bit of nastiness is absolutely fine. It'll make a refreshing change. Don't be so nice. But anyway, we're going to kick off today uh, with Elasticsearch, and I'm going to ask Josh to kick us off. Josh. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, go. Uh, um, someone, I don't know if someone uh, has an echo. I mean, someone can mute. Everyone else can mute their mics. Cool. All right, echo gone. Um, so first, uh, I am from Elastic. Uh, I get to show this uh, legal disclaimer before a pitch and before talking about any future product developments and features, um, have a read over this. Basically, uh, don't make any buying decisions based on things that I say. Do your homework and your due diligence. Um, so yeah, that's it for the disclaimer. <laughs> Thanks. We can hide that disclaimer now. <laughs> um, so I am going to talk about Elasticsearch. Um, and uh i will try and be uh slightly less nice than i was last time maybe <laughs> i'm canadian so it's in my blood i guess um so i want to start I, I guess just to first talk about uh like the, the the few points about why i think elasticsearch is a great engine um and not all of it is technical so i think one of the first things that comes to my mind of course is 
uh, the sort of the uh, community that we have uh, around Elasticsearch and around the, the products and the whole stack in Elastic. Um, I would argue that we have the largest worldwide community, but I don't have any numbers to back that up. Um, and it's not just a community in the sense of uh, other people, uh, peer support, which we have a lot of through forums and blogs and books. Um, but also there's a lot of um, third parties developing plugins for Elasticsearch. There's great consulting folks like Open Source Connections, where you can also get professional services and help from. Uh, and chances are, if you have some kind of a problem in Elasticsearch or something that you'd like to do, you're not sure how to do it, if you can't find uh, a forum, a blog, or, or a book, um, there's going to be someone who has probably done this already before. Um, so chances are you will find somebody uh, eventually through one of the various uh, yeah, forums, blogs, books, or third parties. Uh, and I think that's a huge plus for uh, the great community that we have. Uh, I'd also throw in that when you're building a team, uh, a search team or any team using Elasticsearch, uh, we have lots of training programs uh, and hireability is really key uh, these days in particular, um, trying to grow your team uh, either by uh, upskilling people, so going through training or by bringing people in that already have the skills that you need. Um, there's a big hiring pool basically that have uh, Elasticsearch experience. So I, I put that into the, the bucket of a worldwide community. Um, I think another another thing to call out is the pace of development. Um, so Elastic is a pretty big company nowadays. Uh, we have a lot of engineers working on a lot of different products, uh, including and not just only Elasticsearch, um, but the whole stack. Uh, we do releases, minor releases every eight weeks, uh, which is a pretty good pace. Uh, so if you're looking for bug fixes and you're contributing bug fixes uh, through PRs or somebody at Elastic has fixed something, uh, there's a good chance that you're going to see it uh, coming out fairly quickly and you might not have to wait very long. Um, the other thing obviously to talk about are the uh, sort of some of the, the core foundations of Elasticsearch. So we've seen at the core uh, 20 years of you know, a fantastically stable um, uh, search indexing library. Um, experts from Elastic as well contributing directly back um, to Lucene. Uh, I think it was two of the top five or three of the top five Lucene committers from 2020 were Elastic employees. Um, so we have experts in the company. Um, and I think sort of coupled with that, it's you know like a lot of these other engines, uh, we designed Elasticsearch from day one, from the ground up for uh, scale. Uh, so we have a lot of customers running Elasticsearch uh, at extremely large uh, scales, uh, both on-premises and in a cloud environment. Um, uh, and, you know, it's a great experience as well for the developer to be able to go from doing local testing, you know, even spinning up an Elasticsearch in your JVM uh, to do testing. You can go to one node, just testing on your laptop, all the way up to hundreds of nodes uh, in the cloud or on-premises. Um, and it makes it, you know, easy to do. It. And it kind of grows with you as well, not just through scale, but from basic features to advanced features, uh, we're kind of there with you as you go down uh, your search journey. Um, I think another great thing for developer experience uh, is the um, uh, sort of HTTP JSON everything uh, that we approach that we take, including administration. So it's very easy to access for, for developers and, and uh, operators. Uh, and we have, a, of course, a very fully featured uh, query DSL that lets you describe your queries uh, either very simply or uh, very complex if you need to. Um, I guess the last piece for me, which is really yeah, important, especially if you worked in uh, operations or DevOps space, uh, the whole operation story around Elasticsearch, uh, I think is really powerful. So it's easy to deploy, it's easy to manage, it's easy to observe. Uh, you can even use Elastic products to observe Elasticsearch, which is a bit meta, uh, but it works very well. And that's what we do uh, at scale as well. So you can be rest assured that uh, uh, observing your Elasticsearch at scale works well. It's also what we do for our, uh, our cloud uh, cloud offering. Um, I think another great thing that we have is sort of the story around backups, um, restoring using snapshots, very flexible and very easy to do uh, um, test environments, dev environments, um, benchmarking environments, being able to do snapshots on a regular basis, restore them anywhere you want. Uh, and recently uh, we introduced uh, data tiers which gives you the ability to kind of take the snapshotting idea to a whole other level. Um, so it's basically the idea that you can search over 
any data set that is time structured, uh, so logs or chat messages, Twitter tweets, anything you can sort of orient in uh, uh, with a time, uh, you can search now not only indices that are live and hot and ready to be accessed with low latency in your elastic search cluster, but you could also access seamlessly uh, indices that are stored in S3, thereby reducing the cost uh, for you to operate, but still having access to effectively unlimited amounts of data uh, over which to uh, to search over. Um, I think that's about it. I, I think I'm probably at time as well. So I will end there. Uh, and I am excited to dive into some some questions and debates. Next. Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. Um, so from Elasticsearch to uh, probably the, uh, the most well-established search engine in the pack here, which uh, is Apache Solar. Ancham, do you want us to give us your pitch about Apache Solar? Sure. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of history. And uh, Apache Solar, obviously, uh, completely very tightly coupled with Lucene. Uh, really, really, uh, it, it was a long time ago that Apache Solar was uh, created and then open sourced became part of uh, the Apache uh, umbrella. And for the last 10 years, it was uh, it was so closely tied to Lucene that it was actually the same project uh, until recently when the project's now split up only to go its own way. The good part there being uh, the, the underlying set of uh, contributors to these projects are essentially, uh, there's a lot of overlap. So all the, all the good things that Lucene offers uh, are still going to be part of Solar going forward, but uh, the split is going to allow for users to concentrate on Solar specific things and organize and, and, and release stuff that's for pretend to, uh, to Solar going forward. Um, in terms of solar, um, as I said, it's it's been there for out, out there for a very long time, uh, making it, I, in my opinion, one of the most mature um, and scalable as well uh, sort of solution that is out there. Uh, just because it's been out there uh, and people have been using it in really diverse and varying use cases, they've tried to do all sorts of interesting things that I wouldn't have ever imagined how you could get a search engine to do to begin with. And Solar has certainly like evolved into being more than just a text search engine over the last five, six years uh, with the introduction of analytics, uh, the introduction of things like uh, learning to rank. Uh, there's so many new features just on the feature set aspect of, uh, of how Solar's journey has been in the recent past. Um, and it doesn't kind of stop with at just being search because it kind of offers stuff like spatial search, analytics, uh, and, and much more. But uh, a whole bunch of people have concentrated on doing stuff that's non typically feature related. So making sure that solar scales. So yes, there are new features that allow for newer use cases, but uh, you also need, uh, need to concentrate on ensuring that, that the system by itself stays stable and scalable if you're introducing a whole bunch of features. And that's what something that's something that solar is kind of very successfully or reasonably successfully managed to do over the years. Um, one of the really cool things of Solar is because it's under the Apache umbrella and because of the way it's structured, um, there there has always been a need for and and by design, Solar 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 is a very plug plugin friendly ecosystem. So uh, there's a whole bunch of frameworks and there's a whole bunch of places where people can plug in stuff that's custom components for them, be it related to like things like security, uh, monitoring. Uh, machine learning or NLP related stuff. Um, it allows for plugging in of a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, as, as Josh just mentioned, um, it releases every eight weeks. I think we, we might be releasing a little more frequently than that, but the better part here is that Solar, Solar has the capability of, because it's a community driven project, um, if there's something that you feel that you really need, you could contribute that back to the community and ensure that that gets re gets released uh, even prior to the eight week window. So you could have more frequent releases only because it's a community driven driven project. Um, there's a, there's been a a whole bunch of emphasis on security of late. If you really look at if you've been following the user list, if you've been ch following the change log. Um, there's a new perspective and a new view of how security has been uh, you know, considered 
uh, for solar as a project. And we didn't we didn't look at it with so so much importance, I guess, in the past. But uh, in the recent past, we've gotten more cognizant of what it means for people to be running the system and how important uh, security aspect to it is. And um, there's a whole bunch of releases that are just security focused uh, uh, now, nowadays. Uh, one thing that I'd like to also highlight is something that, that I gave a talk on at the conference at Buzzwords, which is HA and DR. Um, and I wouldn't dive into HA and DR in particular, but I'm gonna say Solar, uh, Solar has offered things that support HA and DR in the past, but um, they've been replicated now or have evolved into a completely different view or, or you know perspective of designing this, these kind of architecture, which is allow users to have HA and DR on things like pluggable cloud interfaces to allow sto storing of data on a totally different uh, you know, um, location type. And uh, so more and more features that are being developed right now are being developed with, with that in mind. Um, a more recent addition to the solar project, uh, not the main code base, is, is the solar operator, which uh, uh, thanks to all the work by Houston and uh, thanks to Bloomberg for donating that uh, to the community uh, that allows or makes it really easy for people to run solar on, on Kubernetes. And in my opinion, that's like a paradigm shift in terms of how people are gonna uh, use their infrastructure and set up search, concentrating on using their, uh, their infrastructure, which is solar in particular in this case, uh, instead of figuring out how do they set up the hardware and how do they set up uh, their, their solar instances across their uh, existing infrastructure. So, so uh, the solar operator is gonna be a very big change in how the community takes solar and deploys it in, you know, in, the, in the near future. Um, and I'm really excited about that aspect. Um, and with, uh, with 9.0, the first release that's gonna happen with Lucene and solar as separate projects, um, there's a lot of cleanup and it, the, without the independence uh, of being independent of Lucene has allowed people in the solar community to move forward with. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to it because there's been a whole bunch of effort towards uh, cleaning up of code base. Um, and what that really means is even though solar is a really old project maintained by community, so there's not there's not one project manager who's who manages this and and has a timeline for when things are going to be released. Uh, the community has taken it onto itself to clean up stuff and make things better, reduce the craft, uh, stabilize things before the first release happens. That's outside of the Lucene umbrella, um, and all of this uh, ties back into there's just more and more use cases because of the features that Solar offers in combination with the stability and scalability that Solar offers. But most importantly, and I think I've mentioned that in the past, uh, uh, the project is driven by the Apache Bay, which in my opinion is one of the strongest factors why Solar has been around for such a long time and has maintained, uh, has, and has ensured that the project stays healthy um, through this duration. So yeah, uh, just to summarize, it just it's a project that has a great set of features. It's proven itself to be uh, stable, scalable, and mature. Uh, it has a great, great community that has stayed active. If you look at the contributors, we continue to get new contributors. Uh, by the same time, the the people who've been around for ten years or more are still around. The people are still ex those people are still excited about the project, and that that says a lot about. Uh, someone wanting to rely on solar as, as uh, an infrastructure of choice for them. Fantastic, thank you, Anshul. Um, so our last pitch today is going to be from Joe Christian on Vespa. Now, how on earth do you compete with these two very strong search engines, Joe Christian? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, how can there possibly be a third choice? It's true, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's really, Great hearing, you know, from two uh, I would say industry leading experts in in the search to to you know to hear their pitch. And luckily, I get to go last. Uh, since we are the new kind of new kid on the block here, um, you know, I, I I get to talk about features and not so much about the community. So that's that's uh, one thing. Um, 
So maybe not everybody has heard about uh, Vespa and, and what Vespa is. So I'll quickly talk about what Vespa is. So uh, we define Vespa as a kind of a, a serving engine for um, low latency computations over evolving data sets. So it's not only uh, a powerful search engine, but it's used for a variety of um, real-time serving use cases. So uh, also including uh, recommendation or recommendation use cases. So search and recommendation is by far uh, the two most common use cases that uh, Vespa is used for. Um, and Vespa was uh, open sourced uh, under the Apache 2.0 license in 2017. Uh, but actually, development of Vespa uh, goes back to 2003, uh, when the team here in Trondheim uh, was acquired by Yahoo. So it has a really uh, long history, uh, and it's been, uh, for us and also now for other people, uh, a really battle-proven uh, platform. It's not something new, shiny, uh, that's just uh, arrived. It's been there for a long time, but it hasn't been in the open. And if we talk about the scale uh, that we operate Vespa in, inside Yahoo, uh, we serve about 25 billion uh, query requests every day. So that says something about the volume uh, that we, uh, or the scale that we actually operate uh, Vespa uh, at, at Yahoo. Um, so I think, and uh, also on the releases, um, so I think that I, I just checked actually on, uh, because you can run Vespa uh, using Docker, and I just checked uh, the Docker Hub, and we have actually three releases uh, in the last seven days. Uh, so I think we have a very uh, incremental uh, releases. So if you have some issues or feature requests, we are pretty responsive. Uh, to 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 improve uh, to 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 include new features as well. So, uh, but I would like to talk about search and and why Vespa is uh, a good choice for building uh, a modern search application. Um, and first, when I talk about search, um, I'm thinking about the case where there's a user that's actually typing a, a, a query and uh, wanted to find some information, and that's the kind of context and. In that context, I think there are two uh, kind of primary reasons why uh, Vespa is, is a great search engine for building a modern search experience. And number one is that it supports uh, a broad range of modern uh, retrieval and ranking methods, uh, including uh, pre-trained transformer models like BERT and also uh, vector search. And the second point is that uh, Vespa supports uh, true real-time indexing and true partial updates. So yesterday I gave a talk on, on the real-time indexing architecture, so you can go uh, check that into details. Um, but having this uh, large uh, toolbox in, in Vespa is that you can start off with a simple uh, traditional BM25 uh, ranking model, and then you can build from there uh, once you get training data for your domain, then you can start using more uh, modern techniques to uh, enhance the search experience. And Vespa also handles uh, both structured and, and unstructured data, and uh, very importantly, vectors or tensors in, in general, uh, they are first-class citizens in, in the Vespa kind of document model. So you can use tensors in queries, and in documents, and you can also use uh, tensors in ranking functions where you can combine uh, query tensors and document tensors. And when I talk about tensors, you might think that they're only relevant for the new kind of modern uh, national language processing and so on. But uh, the original idea where we had when we wanted to use tensors in, in the Vespa document was actually around a recommendation where you could use uh, the tensors to represent various click feedback features. So. There's actually a, a blog post on that uh, on our blog, Vespa AI, where the homepage team in Yahoo talks about how they use Vespa to uh, recommend um, recommend articles on the homepage using Vespa and, and using these uh, click features as, as tensors. Uh, also, uh, Vespa supports um, uh, approximate nearest neighbor search, and that's something that Solar or Elasticsearch does not have uh, currently. Uh, I know it's coming in, in Lucent 9, but we can talk about that other, uh, later, I mean. And 
I think having that capability um, to do uh, vector search in, in, in invest by in one engine is is really important because uh, that allows a lot of kind of new uh, use cases and also uh, techniques that have demonstrated uh, very good performance on various uh, ranking data sets. So it's a really good method. And also for recommendation, this is important. But I think the the implementation in, in actually in VESPA of vector search and uh, approximate nearest nearest search using HNSW is unique in the industry, actually, because you can combine uh, the vector search with regular uh, search terms. And I think that's really important. And that was one of the key takeaways from uh, the talk yesterday from Max Irvin from Open Source Connections when he talked about vector search. And he said, you know, if you use a vector search library to power uh, your search engine and someone comes and typing in a phrase query, like right, using quotes, you would expect that that user actually wanted to search for that phrase, right? And vector search does not give you that uh, possibility, but in Vespa, you have this wide range of, of methods that you can use so you don't have to have different tools for different queries and different use cases. So I think that's really, um, uh, really useful. And speaking of uh, vector search and, and moving to machine learning, so Vespa integrates with a lot of popular uh, machine learning frameworks, so like uh, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, and also the kind of classic um, learning to rank models like uh, XGBoost and, and LightGBM, which is of the GBDT family. And so you have this kind of, there's no one machine learning framework that solves all the problems, but you have a lot of them in, in Vespa, so you have a lot of flexibility. And finally, on, 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 on modern search, um, like we talked about in the last debate, I think that uh, search is actually going through a paradigm shift where we see that these pre-trained uh, transformer models have really transformed uh, search. And it was demonstrated on the MS Marco passage ranking data set. So when researchers apply that uh, BERT into, into the, to the leaderboard, they advance the state of the art by 30%. And, and that basically came overnight, right? In, in within five days or so in, in January 2019. So I think it's a really interesting time to, to work in, in search and, and see uh, how, uh, how, how this is going to progress. And that's one thing I think is, is missing from uh, Lucene that you don't have uh, the ability to represent these new state-of-the-art ranking models in in Lucene, which then uh, basically means that Elasticsearch and Solar don't have this capability. And yeah, so that's basically on, on the kind of search and the features in Vespa. And the other thing is, um, what I think is really important is that Vespa has this, what I call uh, true uh, real-time indexing, <clears throat> so that we don't, uh, like I talked about yesterday, is that we have uh, this uh, mutable memory index, which allows you to add and update documents uh, with millisecond latency. And when you get the response back, the actual operation has been applied and is, is visible in search. And this kind of enables uh, new use cases because uh, in the case, for example, if you have 1 billion documents and you want to change your ranking model or you want to change some signals, you don't have to re-index all of the documents. You can just do partial updates and updates for instance, an attribute or a tensor field. And then the ranking models, which are working on this, this data, they can take that into effect immediately. So I think that's really powerful. And one of the reasons we did this actually and implemented it was back in 2008 when we, um, when we were running Flickr uh, on, on Vespa and they really wanted to, and they had a really large corpus and they wanted to update um, uh, a signal, but refeeding all the documents over again, it didn't, it didn't really scale. And that's where we weigh this partial update feature. And that could really uh, transform their search, search experience because they could offline uh, produce this uh, rank feature, which they would update uh, all the photos with uh, regularly. So to summarize um, uh, why I think that Vespa is a great search, uh, a great choice for, for building a search application, I think uh, it's number one, it has a lot of uh, modern retrieval and ranking methods. And number two, it has this great indexing pipeline for uh, both real-time indexing and also for doing uh, partial updates. So that's basically what I have prepared. And I'm really, I have to say, I'm really super excited of being here. Like you said, Charlie, you know, we, we, we figure out there's 
collectively 65 years of search experience. So I'm really happy to, to, to be here and talk about search and, and, and with these industry leaders in, in search. So I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really uh, hoping for a lot of questions and, and, and debate. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe Christian. So, um, so you've heard the pitches from our three experts, uh, three very different uh, engines, some shared history, some shared heritage, even some shared libraries, um, different models, uh, different ways of uh, perhaps uh, managing the search engines. Um, it seems that uh, release speed, um, from that, what you've all said, uh, the quicker you release new updates of your search engine, the better it is. <laughs> you've all mentioned that i thought that amused me that amused me a little um i'm not sure that's the metric we should uh, we should necessarily hold ourselves to um so i'm going to um j jump into some questions we've had a few questions submitted um and i'm going to start with one um let me see uh actually this this is a, a question for josh um i think this will be probably josh can answer this one Somebody asks, uh, I'm new to Elasticsearch and I'm looking for the Swiss Army knife of Solar's eDismax parser, query parser in Elasticsearch. How hard is this to re-implement in Elasticsearch? I'm not familiar with the details of the eDismax. Maybe Anshin wants to talk about it as well. In terms of you're new to Elasticsearch, you want a Swiss Army knife, uh, you're doing search over multiple fields, uh, use multi-match. Uh, and the default multi-match type, I believe, is best field, I believe. Uh, and it does surprisingly well out of the box with no tuning. Uh, and you can tune it. Um, and this was actually part of uh, a submission to the MS Marco um, ranking task that I did was tuning uh, best fields uh, as well as cross fields. Uh, and, and for a short time, it was uh, the best non-neural approach uh, in MS Marco document ranking. Uh, so, I, I mean, I would say just use multi-match. Uh, you can try some of the other, like some of the, the subtypes of multi-match. Um, that's probably the easiest place to start. I'd love to hear from Anchum. Edis Max, what's the magic? What's the secret sauce there? Uh, and maybe there's I a more equal, like a better equivalent in the Elasticsearch land. What do you I think, I think it's just years, years of evolution of the parser that kind of came to be based on what everyone wanted. And but it does a lot of what I call magic, basically, at this point. Uh, it's complex. So I'm pretty sure there's, there's a way to get the same implementation in Elastic. Uh, I don't know if it exists or uh, the stuff that you you just mentioned can do that out of the box as of now. It may do better or worse, but uh, I guess it's not the same thing. So I don't think there's anything else that's like the Edismax parser. And in my previous jobs, uh, we've tried to have something that's kind of similar, but you end up using the Edismax parser if that's what you really want to do. So, so I'm pretty sure, sorry, sorry go I'm on. pretty sure as well there is a open source connections actually in your repo. I remember seeing an Edis Max in Elasticsearch query parser, but don't quote me on, on that. I'm going to go look afterwards. I, I, shall, I shall have to ask one of my colleagues. In fact, mm. if there's anyone from OSC sitting in the chat, do drop in a link if you can do a quick a trawl through the GitHub. Um, Joe Christian, you're familiar with Edis Max, I guess. Um, is there something equivalent in Vespa? I'm actually not familiar with uh, e, e distance Max, no, I'm not. We have okay, uh, you only here. Oh, oh. Yeah. How about I, I, that? Actually, you give us the uh, the very quick, uh, the very the, the, the thirty second introduction to what EDS Max does. Uh, so it's a tough, it's tough magic, thirty second. Though. Yeah, it's magic, is what I'd say. There's just a lot of tuning parameters that allow you to pass in the the, the terms that you really want to search on, and. Uh, and no, there's no machine learning involved and there's nothing else involved. It's just a very standard way of saying these, th this is how I really want to search on these possible fields that I really want my results to be based on. As I recall, it's about saying, you know, we're looking for matches in various fields and then we're going to take the one that wins um, in terms of matching. So it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of choosing scores 
uh, so it, it, how, how does scoring work in Vespa in an equivalent way? Yeah, so, so yeah, by that explanation, um, we have very good support for, uh, because you can, you can write your uh, very flexible uh, ranking expression, because really in, in Vespa compared to both Solar and Elastic, it's not so much about how you build this huge uh, query tree, uh, because like, and you want to add some boost here and you add some weights in the query. Uh, so Vespa is not really like that. You have the user query, clean and simple, and then you have the the YQL, uh, which is the kind of application logic with the filtering. If you want to have some age filter, range filter, and then in the ranking, you can write things like um, if you want to have the maximum or if you want to have the sum uh, for these kind of basic uh, features uh, over, and you can iterate over the fields if you want to do that. Um, and you also have this what we call uh, field sets, which is similar to this uh, new feature was added to Elasticsearch, where you can simply add some query terms. And then it's called multi-match, or what's the what? I don't recall. Josh probably had the details. There was yeah, some new feature. Multi-match is the, the class of uh, multi-field search types, and then there's a bunch of types right. uh, that are, are more specific below that. Right. Yeah. So in in Vespa, that that translates to what we call uh, field sets. So in the schema, you basically say, okay, I have my title, my bodily, my URL, the anchor text, and then you can have a field set default, which points to title, uh, body, URL, anchor text. So when you're searching a free text query, uh, then you will search all of these fields, and that determines really what are the documents that are surfaced into the ranking function. And the ranking function is basically uh, semi-mathematically notation uh, where you write down uh, what you want. And you can actually combine like uh, writing if, so if the score in the title, and this is used when we use uh, GBT models, for example. So yeah, I think we have something that is in the, in the what you described there on that feature, we have something similar uh, in West, but not exactly the same, same wording though. So I was also wrong. The, the reference I saw was in Relevant Search, the book. Uh, there oh. is no plugin. I did a quick Google, and that's where I found it. So, uh, so talking about the eDismax, it's basically an extension of the Dismax query parser that Lucene has, right? Like, so it uh, it does a bunch of stuff, as I said, which is stuff like allowing for pure negation queries and uh, sloppy searches and uh, allowing you to configure a bunch of things. But at the end of the day, it's just taking a query, breaking it down into multiple pieces. Uh, and as Charlie mentioned, scoring the same document based on all of those matches and picking the one that was the max score. So instead of uh, summing all those scores up, it would just pick the one that, so it's gonna score based on what was the best match uh, among the sub queries that were formed. Interesting. So really, you know, we've got three very different uh, approaches here. We've got the solar approach where something's rather evolved over time and it's become a really good sort of general solution to most most problems. It's the, it's, you know, any, any solar expert will tell you, well, you should probably be using the EDIS Max unless you've got a really good reason not to. And then you've got um, uh, Elastic, which has tried to implement some sim similar things here. And from what I understand from Vespa, you've got a very flexible scoring setup. Um, but I hear a lot of you could do, you can do. So maybe you, yep. that, that, uh, that kind of general solution, general purpose solution is missing. Would that be true to say? Um, across fields, you mean? No, I don't think that, uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that because basically you can iterate uh, over the fields in your index and you can say, do I want to have the sum or if you want to have the max uh, and you can choose, uh, do I want to have uh, the score as BM25 or do I want to use a native rank or do I want to use any of the other uh, text ranking features that we have built into the platform. So I wouldn't say that it's like so, so I, I think it's pretty damn good uh, actually because it gives you full control. Fantastic. Yeah, we're not, we're not doubting your, uh, your ability, you know, your uh, sharing of us, but don't worry. You know, it's pretty damn good. So I'm going to move on to a different question now. So um, uh, let's have a look. Um, I, well, I mean, I, I, I'm going to ask this again of you, uh, Joe Christian. Um, are there use cases when not to use Vespa? Yes. yes. 
There, I mean, we are not everything to everybody. Uh, we're definitely not that. I think for uh, search use cases like uh, that Elastic is really good at uh, dealing with what I call uh, immutable data. So do data that really doesn't change. Uh, so for example, log data. Uh, if you have petabytes of log data, uh, Vespa is not uh, the right engine to use to search that data. Uh, because we are focusing uh, on the real-time aspect. And like I said in my pitch, uh, we really designed the engine to handle uh, evolving uh, data set. And a lot of the design decisions uh, that we did around uh, some of the parts of the index is served in memory and so on, uh, doesn't become that cost effective when you have a huge amount of data. Uh, that being said, uh, we also have some uh, interesting options uh, in Vespa that is not that well known or well described. So uh, what we call the Vespa streaming search, which basically doesn't uh, build um, uh, index structure. It just stores the data. And once you want to search it, we basically scan through it. And I think uh, in the recent years, when you see more uh, advanced hardware, like Amazon, uh, AWS, they announced uh, you can get uh, EC2 nodes with uh, 100 gigabits, uh, and you can get terabytes of memory and 448 vCPUs. You know. Uh, for these kind of low QPS uh, use cases, uh, it might actually be that uh, streaming through that data is actually an option to to load it from S3 and then stream through it. So, yeah, so that's definitely one case in the current uh, when using Vespa index search, which is which is which is actually building index structures. I would not use it for uh, terabytes of, of log data. I think you're on mute, Troy. Well, let's uh, let, let's turn that question to uh, Josh. What's not a good use case for Elasticsearch? Um, uh, so Elasticsearch has a lot of things, a lot of things well. Uh, I would say uh, Elasticsearch was was built with sort of classic uh, classical search, uh, BM twenty five scoring and inverted indices, standard Lucene data structures. Um, I love I love this terminology. I can't remember where I saw this um, of the phases, I like the the life cycles uh, in in search industry. And so there's this classic uh, approach, which is you know 30 years old. Uh, then there's modern search, which brings learning to rank. Uh, and luckily, we have uh, great contributors from Open Source Connections that have a learning to rank plugin for Elasticsearch, which is fantastic. And I'd argue that brings us to modern search. Um, we are not quite at what I guess is called postmodern search, uh, where Joe Christian has mentioned uh, ANN indices with HNSW and being able to represent um, uh, deep neural networks in uh, the search engine. Uh, we know that Lucene uh, has H HNSW implementation. It's coming in Lucene 9. Um, it will not be before Elasticsearch 8. Uh, so it'll be at least after Elasticsearch 8, um, timing of that TBD. Uh, so we know that's coming. We know that's coming to Elasticsearch. So, you know, we're getting on the board, on the playing board uh, for ANN. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm happy to, to be able to say here that we're also investing in uh, native PyTorch integration in Elasticsearch, uh, which will bring uh, modern NLP, modern information retrieval, sorry, postmodern, uh, information retrieval techniques into Elasticsearch uh, in a native fashion. Um, and those kinds of, uh, those two investments that we are making, uh, I think will bring us into the postmodern uh, post era. And, you know, the next couple of years, uh, I think, you know, we won't have that gap anymore. I think it's that, that gap is going to close. Um, but I think we're, you know, we're thinking about it probably in a little bit different way than Vespa does. So, for us, ease of use and approachability is uh, is very important, as well as supportability. You know, people have to be able to go into our cloud service, click, 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 it, and it's got to work. Um, so there's a, a huge investment uh, in, in both of those technologies to make sure that it's easily approachable, uh, works out of the box, uh, and works well in a cloud environment. Great. So, yeah, I mean, the vector thing seems to be an area where we've got different teams chasing different you're all chasing towards that, as you say, postmodern search. I love that term, by the way. I'm going to steal that one. 
Um, it's not mine. <laughs> I got it from someone else. I'm trying. Okay. I think it was Sebastian Hofstetter from TU Wien, uh, who has an online course. I think I saw it there in some slide deck. I'm not sure, but it's a great description. So I'm going to keep using. Brilliant. it. That's brilliant. Ansham, what, what's uh, and um, uh, uh, what's a, what's uh, what's not a good use case for solar? Oh, um, I'm going to just piggyback partially on what uh, Josh has already said, because well, uh, we're both kind of still under relying on Lucene at the back uh, to power search. But in particular, I think solar is just not designed uh, with, with nested documents in mind. So if you have anything that's deeply nested, uh, most of the sort of features are not guaranteed to work for you, even though it's it's kind of fuzzy. It's not well defined. It's not well documented. Even I would say, um, I think anyone who has a use case uh, where the document is so nested and it's very hard to normalize, um, I think that's something that sort of can't handle. It. In addition to uh, sort of not being designed as a primary data store. So if you have documents that are really large, uh, where you're trying to store large fields. It's gonna blow up. So if you if you're trying to fetch those fields back, it's again, uh, it's just not designed for any of that. Yeah, I, I think the the whole thing about not using your search engine as a primary data store is uh, is a repeated theme. And uh, yes, we see it all the time. And please don't do it. Um, thank you. So um, let's just come back to another question from our panel and. Uh, this is going to come back to Joe Christian, and it's slightly related. Are there some features in Solar Elasticsearch that Vespa doesn't support? Uh, yes, there, there's obviously going to be uh, feature gaps uh, between these uh, three engines. So definitely there are some features that we, we miss. Uh, if you're specific about a feature, I can answer if, if we have something that is uh, equivalent. Uh, I, I, so yeah, but there, there's definitely um, uh, some features gaps uh, between Vespa and, and the Lucene engines, for sure. OK, OK, you can't think of anything specific. Snapshots. Yeah, of course. If you look at the uh, yeah, if you look at the entire kind of the whole solution, uh, yeah, snapshot, we don't have uh, the snapshot uh, capability uh, that Elasticsearch have that you can freeze uh, the index and then do a snapshot and then put it on S3. Uh, we don't have anything like that, no. What about, um, this is another related question actually, um, reverse search support. I mean, Elastic, we have the percolator. And now in, in, I mean, in Lucene, it's not quite serviced in solar yet. We have the Lucene Monitor, which I'm proud to say my previous company, Flax, developed and then contributed to Lucene. So do you have a reverse search capability in Vespa? Uh, it depends really what you mean by uh, reverse search. So you have search. a set of uh, queries and you're going, to, you're going to basically watch something and see if it matches any of those queries. Right. So we have this um, uh, feature that doesn't really... Um, we have this other interesting feature that we called uh, predicate fields, where you can actually uh, store a, a Boolean constraint uh, in the document. So you can say that in this document, uh, I will only be matched by if certain attributes are set. And you can combine that with a Boolean expression. So that is a way that you can, for instance, run some campaigns. So in an e-commerce setting, you can say that this document is only going to be actually matched against the query if certain attributes are uh, set. So that can be actually it's different. It's it's kind of reverse because the logic of if you're going to match or not is actually uh, stored in the document. But it's not uh, the same uh, as as you described that you set up a saved query and then you look at the stream of documents and say if it matches. Uh, but that could be built uh, in a custom document processor. Yes. It's a similar, but not 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 just the same. No. Okay. Okay. So um, coming back to comp comparing features, Ansham, is there anything from uh, Vespa that you see would be a really great addition to to Solar um, in terms of something that might inspire a new feature for Solar? Oh, tough one for me. Uh, not the machine learning person in the room for sure, uh, and so. 
I'm pretty sure because there's been limited investment by only a very few select folks in that field. Uh, like learning to rank happened, and then there's been a certain set of people who've been interested in that that, that aspect of solar. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a lot to learn from Vespa along those lines. Uh, we've generally been heavily invested in more uh, more around solving the infrastructure challenges, uh, be it in the form of solar operator or making sure solar scales well. Uh, and there's been little investment on the machine learning side of things. So I think uh, both plug immunity and um, and just everything else that Vespa offers is is a great uh, you know place for us to learn from and, and kind of uh, bring that that cool stuff into solar. What about this uh, then, uh, Josh? Because I, I guess you know you know the machine learning side. Is there are there things that you look at Vespa and go, oh, I wish we could put those in? I like uh, quite a lot the composability and the, the way you describe ranking. In Vespa, I, I think it's very clean. I think it's a very um, nice approach that gives you a lot of uh, flexibility and power, but it, it's easy to grasp. Um, I think we, I think we could do a better job there. Um, we definitely look at things as like we want to give people a good set of of tools. Um, uh, so, like with multi match, you know, we have a bunch of different types of multi match, but if you want to really understand what's going on behind those multi-match uh, queries. You know, you got to dig into some documentation, you got to try some things. I think for uh, real experts that are really uh, tuning uh, ranking, especially with text-based uh, ranking, uh, I think their approach to describing ranking functions is quite nice. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. OK, OK, great. Sorry, am I being too nice? <laughs> being too nice still. still. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> well, you know, maybe if we were all in the actual, actually in the same, the same physical space, it's very hard to, to you know, to <laughs> throw a punch over Zoom. Um, anyway, um, not that I'm suggesting any of you lovely people would ever do that. Um, so um, we've got a question here from our audience, and uh, somebody saying, as a SaaS provider of search, um, which. Um, obviously wouldn't be popular in some places. Uh, I won't say anymore. Uh, Vespa looks interesting and something we'll be looking into providing to our customers, but the whole deployment package upload seems clunky if we want to let our customers do small frequent changes to their setups through our solution. Elasticsearch excels at this, being driven by a simple API that allows you to make many small and quick changes. Am I missing something about Vespa? Um. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. So the whole, if you want to build, so if I understand the question correctly, uh, you want to build kind of a multi-tenant, uh, search as a service, uh, on top of our, uh, cloud offering, uh, in that case, uh, um, yeah, I, I can, I can, uh, agree that it's not, uh, perfect because everything in, in the, in Vespa world is about having uh, an application package uh, where you have uh, the schema, uh, the deployment, uh, the flavor specification, how many hosts, how many nodes you're going to use for containers serving uh, for the content cluster and so on. So everything is, is around this um, application package. And that one of the reasons is, is that then you can push uh, from GitHub actions and so on. So, and you actually have version control uh, over the changes that you're making. So uh, I think we're coming from a very conservative, uh, even if we release uh, often, we have a lot of testing and, and so on, but that's still conservative. We don't want to do a curl parameter to change something on some operator, uh, you just the, the index APIs and, 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 and to, to change something. So everything is around an application package. So that, that's correct. So. Um, but we we are really open for I mean to, to feedback uh, on the on the process about uh, using our hosted service. So that's definitely if that's a real pain point, you know, we we can probably work something out on that. So we are really I, I feel that we are really responsive to uh, feedback that we are really engaging uh, with the community in the, in the Vespa Slack space that we have created uh, and also at the, your relevancy. Uh, Slack space and on Gitter and Twitter and 
so I, we we and also on GitHub issues. So really, you know, bring uh, all the feedback uh, to us. You know, and, and that's the only thing you know that we can learn from it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the other thing, though, is uh, you're also I know that the Vespa team are work, uh, you know, part of your commercial model is is the idea that you're you're providing Vespa as a service. Um, is yeah. that correct? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So we, we just announced uh, general availability and uh, also uh, we offer free uh, trials for this uh, cloud service. Yeah. So you can so go to cloud. Yes, so it's what you're saying you have you have uh, you know you, you're you're looking at challenges there in terms of you know, scalability and and uh, Anshan mentions that a lot of work's gone into this recently in in solar. Or we have the uh, the cross data center replication. I caught some of your talk earlier this week. Um, so th this seems a major topic in terms of you know how do we run these massive clusters in a solid, reliable fashion? Um, do we? Do we think that those problems are going to be solved any anytime soon? I mean, I will I'll direct this to Ansham because I know that the in the solar world there have been some attempts at various things that haven't quite panned out and have been pulled again. Um, do we think we're settling in on some nice reliable solutions? Ah, oh, great question. And uh, I think I've been involved in a few of those attempts, pretty much across different organisations and. Um, it's a very hard problem to solve, in my opinion. Uh, while setting up the infrastructure bits are still relatively easy, the challenge is around search by by its inherent nature being a very complex and use case specific setup. So unlike a database where you spin it up and you have an instance and then all you are needed to do is define table and push data into it, uh, search has so many you know, uh, things that you can change and configure, custom code that you could deploy and plugins that you might need, that it makes it really challenging for, for multi-tenant system to work. It works really well for the bottom of the pyramid in, in, in case of, it, if that's how I, you'd let me define the, use, uh, the user base for search. Uh, people who have basic search use cases where they have a bunch of data and they want it searched, they're not really bothered about custom plugins it works reasonably well for them. As soon as complications start coming in, uh, be it machine learning stuff or be it uh, just basic, uh, you know, indexing pipelines, it starts getting more and more complex. So I don't know when this is going to be solved because it's a really hard problem to solve to begin with. Uh, it's it's non-trivial. Um, so I I've seen this being attempted a few times and. If you have specific use cases you want to cater to, you can still deal with it. But if your use cases are not bounded, then this becomes a really challenging problem. I don't know if, if it's going to be solved in the near future, though. Josh, do you think that's the Elastic team are doing any better at this? Um, I feel very confident that I can say yes. <laughs> um, and I think one of the reasons is that it's so fundamental to our customers, it's so fundamental to all of the use cases that we support. So being able to do things like cross data center, cross cluster replication, cross cluster, cross data center search. Um, these are things that we've invested on, invested in over many years at extremely large scales. Um, and you know, we've just, like I mentioned at the beginning, we've just introduced data tiers, which brings kind of a new dimension for how you can manage your data and how you can search across extremely large data sets, um, terabytes, petabytes of data. Um, I think we have a number of tools in the toolbox, let's say, um, and they're used quite heavily at large scales, particularly in our logging, observability, security use cases, um, which rely very heavily on being able to have disaster recovery, high availability, um, compliance reasons that you have to search across extremely old data sometimes as well. Um, yeah, this is part of our bread and butter. Uh, this is what we think about every day. You know, we don't only think about uh, search relevance, but it's about scale, it's about operations, it's about ease of use, it's about building a rock solid products. So uh, yeah, I feel pretty confident that uh, we've put a, a lot of investment in that area and it, you know, we won't stop. It's so fundamental to, uh, to our customers. And I guess, Joe Christian, I mean, you, you, you've come from 
Vespa, you know, is being used at uh, Verizon, Yahoo, whatever, mm. and over you know, over very large, large scale systems. But do you, do you think you've you've made strides in this area, or there's still a way to go? Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, we operate uh, Vespa in the kind of private uh, Vespa cloud uh, inside Yahoo. We have about ten production regions. Uh, so obviously, Yahoo, we are all over the globe. So we are used to uh, running multi-region uh, setups. Uh, so no doubt about that. Uh, in the public offering that we talked about, I think we are currently at three or four uh, regions. So yeah, multi-region, high availability, uh, scalability, latency. Of course, it's it's really fundamental, right, for uh, our business. And and so Vespa has really been a battle proven platform for for this so this is um yeah so it's really a feature that uh, we spend a lot of time to to uh to build over over and also the all the experience from running uh web search uh in this team and and we've been developing vespa now since 2003 so I think a lot of experience on distributed systems uh, have gone into the the version of vespa that we are seeing right now um on the cold tiering uh, stuff that uh, josh uh, is talking about uh, we don't have that right so because it, it, we are working on the evolving data sets uh, for real-time serving uh, those are the use cases that we focus on uh so we typically have uh, everything hot right um so i'd sorry. just like to go ahead okay. Go ahead. No, I just like I'm not. I just wanted to clarify a few things so that Solar doesn't lose out the, any points here. But right. um, so yes, so so <laughs> we've used Solar as a multi-tenant system supporting multiple clusters for multiple use cases uh, used by different teams uh, as an internal offering. But it, the complications arise by, by definition because Solar is pluggable. Uh, to be able to provide an offering that allows you to plug in custom code and then for you to maintain it, not knowing what's inside that code and having the power to like really be sure it's not exposing a security risk for everyone else who's co-hosted uh, kind of makes it super complicated. So uh, I didn't mean to say that it's not possible to host multi-tenant solar. That certainly is done in multiple places very successfully. It's just more complicated with a public facing interface where you're allowed to plug in custom components, but custom code, um, and make it work. Yeah, and I guess you know there's implementations like at Salesforce, which I know is you know massively multi-talent to, to some ridiculous yes. degree. Um, yes. So people are certainly doing it. I guess the difference here is also about the you know the the, the, the products, the communities, whatever, because um, you know with Solo you're trying to be you know offer general solutions to, to people with. With Elastic and and Vespa, you know you, you're 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 in control in some way of the the hosted versions of the the system that you're providing, um, you know, as products. You know you, you you can say you can have this plugin, but you can't have that one. You know you can you can put some limits on the pluggability. Joe Christian, uh, actually the. The hosted version, the cloud offering that we offer now uh, for general availability, you can you can use it uh, in the same way that you're using uh, Vespa on-prem. Uh, so all the features, so you can plug in searchers, document processors. Uh, we don't offer like a semi-smaller uh, feature version, uh, though we do add some more uh, security constraints uh, and isolation so that in the it's a multi-tenant system but the deployments does not share anything uh so they are isolated so that in terms you you don't want anything to break out there are a lot of uh, security around this but we do allow people to um have full access to deploying uh machine learn ranking uh custom models uh pytorch models onx gbdt so the full feature set of, of west but you, you are allowed to 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 use that and, and we have the experience of, of of running it so i think um, yeah so we, we do support having uh, the full-fledged version not some kind of smaller uh, easier to use version okay yeah 
Cool. Well, I'm going to change tack here slightly because we've got a few questions backing up in our in our chat room. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, some specific questions and, and try and give me a nice brief answer if you can. So, uh, Josh, first one for you. What is the status of graph search and elastic search? Is it deprecated? Elastic don't seem to be talking about it a great deal. Pass. <laughs> it's, Pass. I mean, it's supported as it always was. Um, as far as I know, there's no active work, like new development. Uh, unfortunately, that's all I know. Um, there are some of my colleagues on the chat, and if they would like to add, I'm happy to hear it. Um, yeah, that's about all I can say. Okay, right. Uh, Joe Christian, how big is the VASPA team? How many committers in-house and community? I think the committers uh, list on the GitHub VASPA, I, I don't recall, but I think there's like 70 or 80 people that have committed. Uh, the core, I can't really comment on the kind of the size of the, the core team uh, working on it, uh, but if the global, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I can, um, quote uh, specific numbers but if you look at github and the contributor list there you, you can find uh, who, who's contributing to to vespa because we do all the feature development um, all the development in the open so so I basically uh, everything uh, of vespa is open source and if you go to the github vespa engine uh, you will see it's buzzing. Uh, I mean, it's in the weekends and the afternoons. There's a lot of activity going on. So, uh, all the development is in the open. Uh, the issues are in the open. So everything is in the open. So seventy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I've got one for Antrim just to even things out here. So, in the old days, uh, Sun and Lucene were separate projects, and then they became one project. And I remember from talking about how that was good and bad at the time, and it became solar slash leucine slash solar now it's become it's split apart again we've got the leucine project and the solar project um so will it be a few years and they're one project again i i don't think so i think there were uh this was discussed on the mailing list very well and there was uh there was some some background given as to why they got together because there was a bunch of shared stuff that did not make sense to be worked on separately and to be synced every now and then um those 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 things have been accomplished and both of these projects have very different um management procedures if you if you want to call it that uh the way both these projects are organized and maintained are different even though they were part of the same repository the and it's the same bunch of people who have permissions to make changes to both of these projects even right now i, I pretty much just uh, it's almost a 99% overlap in terms of contributors or committers. Um, I don't think they're gonna go back into being one again because there's a lot of work that goes into merging a project, merging two projects or splitting them. Um, and that's non-trivial amount of work. And we're putting the amount of work that's needed to split these projects separately into their own build systems, their own release processes, their own everything else. And for people to print, and I'm not saying it cannot happen. I'm just saying I don't see that happening from where I am right now um, because it, it comes with a lot of effort and I don't see a reason to put in that effort again. So never say never, but you don't see it kind yes. of happening. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's let, let's look at a different uh, question here. So uh, another comparative question really. Um, query dsl so there are different ways of querying um i mean in solar we've got stuff on the on the uh um we've got the you know lots of parameters you've kind of got to know the names of lots of parameters but you can also you know you can you can do queries with uh, uh, there's a json api i believe um then elastic search you've got the elastic search dsl in vespa you've got the uh you've got your own query language so let, let's have a look at you know what what are the uh, what are the best and worst things about each of these query languages and what could you learn from the others and i'm going to start that question with josh oh man i really wish you would pick someone else um i mean our query dsl yeah i mean you can do everything every all the query functionality that you 
need to do with Elasticsearch is in the query DSL, you know, including aggregations and uh, yeah, basically everything you want to do in a query. I think that for uh, I would say entry level um, uh, engineers, I think sometimes it can be overwhelming to be faced with this this wall of how do I build a how do I build the right query DSL. Um, so I think it's extremely powerful what you can do with our query DSL. I would like to see maybe a second DSL or a subsection that had some higher level abstractions uh, is what I would call them. Uh, and we have them in a lot of places, but I think uh, I think I think we could find a, a balance between you know giving you all the flexibility, um, but also maybe a, you know an entry point for um, different level of user. A meta DSL. I like that idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about uh, this one, Ansham? Um, I mean, Solar's query language. You know, there are you know mysterious two-word, uh, two-letter codes in there that once you've done it for a while, you understand and you remember them. But how could it do things better? Yeah, I mean, Solar is uh, Solar has a query DSL as well, which has a lot to be desired. Like, there's there's a lot of room of, for improvement on that. It's pretty basic as of now. And uh, the, the JSON query DSL, but the standard way of talking to Solar and querying Solar is, is again, something that's evolved over the years and developed a lot of trust, been developed by people who already understood how the system worked. And so, as you said, there's too many of these parameters. And I've looked at what Elasticsearch has offered and it just, like over the years, and it always makes me feel good about something like that existing. And first, I, I think Solar on that front can totally learn from Elasticsearch and get to that place first to be able to have such an expressive query DSL where you could do so much uh, without having to worry so much about remembering uh, two character parameters that you have no idea what they mean about. Like you go digging into ref guide, which is a great thing, but it's confusing right now. So yes, there's a lot to be desired on the query DSL front for, for Solar. It does offer the JSON query DSL for basic use cases. It's pretty expressive, but it's not there yet. Um, so yes. Uh, Joe Christian, so you've got, I mean, you've obviously you know spent lots of time building your, your, your query language, and I guess it's it's perfect, surely. It's perfect, it's it. for sure. Perfect. Yeah, we have uh, uh, where to start. I mean, <laughs> so uh, you can uh, use uh, uh, a JSON uh, query API uh, to post uh, a query to Vespa, where you have uh, your parameters, like the number of hits you want to return, uh, what is the ranking profile you want to use, and then there's something we call the Yahoo query language, which is a SQL-like uh, query language, where you say, select uh, ID text from tweet where user query, where user query then can point to uh, another query language, which is the actual end user query. So I think it's a clean way of kind of um, separating what the actual user has been typing and so that you don't do any kind of tokenization of the input in the middle tier you want to uh, have uh, to let Vespa deal with that because if you don't you might have some asymmetric behavior of what is happening in indexing time at the query time and there you can in the in the user query parts the query part you can use uh, similar to searching Google, uh, you can use uh, plus sign, uh, you can use quotes. Uh, so you don't have to do a lot of this query parsing uh, on the middle tier and then build a huge um, kind of JSON DSL API. I, I, so I, I think actually our APIs are uh, pretty good. I, I've seen some people uh, just going with the YQL uh, or the, the, the SQL uh, format and then writing the query and then splitting um, the tokens and, and so on, um, which is not a, a great way of doing it. Uh, I think it's better to use this uh, construct where we have, I can say that I want to have the user query and then I want to have to combine it with some other filters. So the SQL like query language will also be syntax checked uh, so you don't have any mistakes in your query. Well, the simple kind of user query language 
uh, and you, uh, it's more uh, relaxed uh, in the way how we parse it. Yeah, so you can post queries, you can get queries. Um, a lot of different options there. Uh, so. I mean, you can do something like a SQL query language in Solar, can't you, Anshan? The streaming uh, API, does that give you? Yes, the, yes, the so streaming API API APIs does. Yes, streaming APIs does give you, it does certainly give you that power. Uh, I don't know how many users have adopted to that. Uh, I don't know how many people use streaming APIs for that purpose, but yes, you certainly can can achieve that. For basic search, uh, yeah, I'm still a big fan of the Elasticsearch API. I haven't moved on from there yet. Still being too nice to each other. I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. I, I also would like to add one more thing is that uh, you can write your own searcher plugins uh, in a nice way where you actually uh, build an API on top of Vespa and then you uh, can build the query uh, programmatically uh, using Java code. So you don't need to expose uh, all the kind of parameters to the, to the middle tier. So you can build uh, your own uh, using the programmatic interface instead. Okay. Oh, so, uh, fear solar is amazing at being pluggable. Trust me. <laughs> yes, but we then have the balance of you know, if to to be pluggable, you then got to write the thing you're going to plug into it. So there's also yes. a balance there between something just working out the box and having all the components yes. you need. So, it, um, a question here from somebody. Um, some of us, we've got some smaller players in the search engine world now. We've actually been running a series on the Haystack Live Meetup, looking at some of these. Um, we've got one coming up on Tantivy, the Rust search engine. Now, one of the things a lot of these engines position themselves as is kind of easier to set up, easier to set up. You don't have to do much. You can just get going. You can just get, get querying. Um, and the questioner asked specifically uh, that, that they it says specifically that they, they position themselves as being easier to set up than even Elasticsearch. Um, but what can we learn from these smaller players? Um, well, we've got things like Weavy8, we've got Maily Search, um, there's a couple of here, Toshi, Sonic that I haven't heard of, Tantivy. What can we learn from these smaller players that are kind of trying to break into the market? And I must say that I'm always really cheered when I see someone writing yet another search engine. You know, you might think that it's a, a task you shouldn't even attempt because, hey, we've got these amazingly mature long engines. But, you know, what can we learn from these smaller, newer players? And I'm going to, I'm going to, ask that question to Joe Christian to start off. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure how do you pronounce it. The Tantiv is, um, I think it's a library. Uh, I don't think it's a full-fledged uh, search engine with uh, the APIs, HTTP APIs and so on. It's, it's more of a search library, uh, as I understand it, right? You can do, uh, and I think they have a lot of uh, inspiration from uh, Lucene, uh, they write about this in their GitHub repository or that. Um, and I know that there's a startup company uh, with the founder of this library. I think the company is called uh, QuickWit. Uh, I think they are trying to uh, build, uh, I don't know what they're building, but I think it's interesting. Uh, but I consider it currently as uh, a library and not a competitor of uh, Vespa or Solar or um, or Elasticsearch. Um, you mentioned Vevit. I think that is um, one of the newcomers, the vector search, uh, neural uh, search. And I think there have been a lot of those uh, lately. And uh, I think also Pinecoin, uh, Gina, a lot of uh, companies coming up uh, in the vector search space. And they're promising uh, neural search uh, to the rescue. And uh, I think in some cases, these uh, have a problem with over-marketing uh, deep, uh, dense vector search. Um, it's not really proven yet that you can take a generalized model and train it on, for instance, MS Marco, and then apply it to a different domain and then have great results. Uh, all the evaluations shows that you really, in order to have great results, you need to train the data on, on your domain. So I'm not sure about this kind of predefined models that will uh, beat uh, kind of the traditional uh, search paradigm uh, straight out of the box. So I'm really skeptical uh, about that thing. Um, and also like Max Irvin mentioned yesterday, 
Um, what if the user is, is doing a phrase search, right? So this capability is, uh, is missing. And also in the real world, I think what is unique with, uh, instead of having a vector search engine, adding actually vector search to a real search engine with the traditional inverted indexes and so on makes more sense because in, in the real world, uh, search is really constrained, right? Either by the user the, itself or by hidden application logic and, and vector search uh, the pure vector search, I'm not sure if, if these uh, mentioned companies actually support this kind of hybrid uh, evaluation model where you can combine uh, both the traditional um, uh, matching with vector search, but Vespa sh certainly do. And when we designed um, and implemented approximate nearest neighbor search in Vespa, that was a really critical thing for us to be able to combine those two. Yeah, so I, I welcome all this. Uh, there are a lot of things to to learn, uh, and 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 there have been a lot of um, popping up this vector search uh, engine. But I'm I'm a little bit skeptic uh, at at the moment on some of these. Okay, so uh, I mean, Josh, they, they, they again the question specifically says they position themselves as being even easier to use than Elasticsearch. Yeah. So is there something we can learn from these engines? Uh. I don't disagree. I agree with everything Joe Christian um, said. I think some of them are 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 niche plays as well. So Tantivy, Tantivy, uh, it, it, it's a library, um, and I see it more as a like embedded type of solution. You have very limited resources on a device or you know IoT or something, uh, and you need a search index. I you know maybe that's a good a good position there. Um, I mean, I like Joe Christian. I'm super excited to be in this field, in this industry during this time because so much is evolving right now, and there's, you know, there is a big paradigm shift happening. Um, I think other things that we can learn are um, non-search use cases or mixed, like multimodal search and you know recommendations use cases. Um, I think things like Gino will be uh, very interesting players in those spaces. Um, yeah, I agree with Joe Christian. I think as uh, what we would view as like text search, um, I think a pure uh, ANN play is not feasible today. Um, I, I'm interested to see what, where it goes in the future. Um, but I, I think I'm also wondering when, like all, all of the ANN type of libraries are also wrapping other libraries that come out of Facebook or Google or you know, NMS lib or something like that. Uh, I'm waiting for companies to start innovating in this space as well and not leaving it to um, only the big guns uh, and, and just wrapping a bunch of libraries. Um, I, you know, I think that's an interesting space uh, to watch is, is the innovation in that space of the NM search in particular. Um, so hopefully some, you know, Gina maybe uh, starts doing that as well. And, and, you know, we, we learn more about how people are using uh, uh, dense vector search, for example. Okay. Anshan, what do you think? I mean, uh, from, uh, if you're looking at Solar and Lucene perhaps being maybe the, the older, more established player in the space, um, at least with you know, a very large community, is there still room for these new search engines and are they doing anything that we can learn from? There certainly is room uh, for these search engines. And um, again, you know, Having been around when Elasticsearch just started, I remember when when it just started, it was like, yeah, they're new, they're small, but there was so much to learn from Elastic, and I'm so glad that we did. Uh, I think uh, anyone who has who used Solar about seven eight years ago can vouch for how how better to use or easier to use it has become, and that's majorly because we looked at Elasticsearch as as the poster child of like, okay. We've been doing things a specific way and it felt right to do so 15 years ago. But now someone's come out and thought about things that we never thought about. Um, and we can always look at them and learn from them. And yes, they would have done things that did not work out for them. Uh, but it's always good to have people coming in with a different perspective with, um, you know, especially all these postmodern search engines coming up. Coming up uh, they're trying to accomplish and do stuff that Solar kind of never thought about again because we've been here for so long. Um, it's always nice and refreshing to to kind of look at look at all the new search engines and try and learn 
uh, not aggressively uh, because uh, you can very quickly lose track of what you really want to do if you try to concentrate on keeping up with everyone. So wait and watch, see what everyone's doing, what things work, and then learn from it. And don't just try to copy it, but try to do that better. Hmm. I mean, uh, it leads on to a, 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 maybe a slightly facetious question that's popped up in our in our line here, which is, uh, um, somebody did vote for it. Uh, can we combine everything into one super engine? Could we have the ease of use of Elastic, the long history and community, and the flexibility and pluggability of Solar, plus the amazing new vector search features of Vespa? Is someone going to sit down there and try and pull all these these things into one engine? I mean, I think we will see convergence. Of, of features in particular. And I think some things will become commodity, uh, just as, you know, BM25, TFIDF. Um, I, I think we do see it. But having competition in the field is really necessary for innovation as well. We And, and I think because of that, there, there will never be, like, there, there will never be one solution to rule them all. I, I think we will see convergence, but I certainly hope actually that there isn't one solution to rule them all. Uh, because I think we can also look for players that are are in niches, uh, and we can learn from each other, like these new uh, these new players. So I'd say, yeah, kind of, but hopefully not actually. <laughs> yes, it's interesting, isn't it? And I do remember those days when Elastic first appeared, and some of the people in the solar community were, oh, this will never catch on. Um, and actually, what it did do is it it put the wind up a lot of people who maybe should have been paying attention to some of the new requirements. And uh, it drove uh, solar development quite hard for a while. I think that was a positive impact. And I'm hoping that the same thing's happening with Vespa appearing on the scene. Judging from what you both said and what other people have said, this will spur innovation. It makes people look at their failings and look at the things that maybe they don't do so well, or maybe they should be looking at. And I think that's a really healthy situation. I think it'd be awful to have a monoculture of search. Uh, do you agree, Joe Christian? Uh, I'm not sure if it's gonna converge into one technology because there's so many different use cases uh, around search. And like I talked about, you know, Elasticsearch coming in really strong at handling immutable data. Uh, Vespa coming in very strong at mutable data where data is changing. Uh, so I think there will be different search solutions for different uh different areas of, of search. I don't think it will converge into one big solution. And uh, the new players, if you'd call Vespa a new player, we've also been around, we have to adapt to ever-changing. You know, we've been around since 2003, so we had to go from on-prem to cloud. Uh, we had to adapt from uh, running on one CPU, 500 megs of RAM into monster machines that we have today, right? So the hardware involvement, uh, we used to have 500 megabits network cards. Now you can get 100 gigabits per second. So a lot of these hardware um, evolvement also will change, you know, how we do search in the future, and especially around low uh, throughput use cases, like um, somebody searching in Kibana. You know, there's very low query throughput. It doesn't really matter if it takes a second. I think there's going to be a lot of innovation uh, in that area because of the, the, the compute changes, the hardware changes, you know. Does I think we've lost Joe Christian. Yep. Oh dear. And we're going to see uh, some okay. some some changes there. All right. Sorry, Joe Christian, you froze for a second. All right. I saw. We'll, we'll leave it there on on that one. So, um, okay. So, I've got a, a brace of questions here, um, and I'm going to ask these. Uh, the first one of these to, to Joe and. Uh, to, uh, sorry, Josh and Ansham. Somebody says, with both Solar and Elasticsearch based on Lucene, I always assume they don't really differ much on relevance. Uh, things like stemming, synonyms, et cetera, they're provided by Lucene. So is that assumption correct or are there real differences in relevancy tuning? Ansham. That's kind of true that the underlying building blocks are kind of shared. But there's enough of a layer, uh, a thick layer that Solar offers on top of everything that Lucene does that essentially makes both of these very different engines to use. Yes, you can accomplish very similar, the same thing using both these engines, I, I guess, for the most part at least. 
Uh, but there's enough of that layer that sort of provides speed in terms of making sure that the input's correct to, uh, to being able to plug multiple things together and the way it, it, they get plugged in together. So they're certainly not the same. And then there's parts of solar that do not really uh, use the underlying Lucene features, even though Lucene as a library would offer something, uh, say facets. Uh, Solar has its own implementation of stuff, even though Lucene offers, um, you know, uh, something similar. Uh, only because uh, someone say it is open source, or so someone someone thought that it would be better or more efficient to do this same thing in Solar using a very different approach. So um, they might seem similar, and yes, they share a lot of building blocks, but they're not. Uh, there's enough of a difference between Solar and Elasticsearch in terms of the implementation itself. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in principle I agree. Um, I, I think the uh, I think the power the power in in relevance tuning though actually comes at the, that abstraction layer, so that like one layer above, where it's about how do you combine all of the um, uh, all the fundamental components that Lucene gives you. So if you're doing a, a multi-field search, um, you know you're going to use an eDismax with some magic. Uh, or you can use multi-match field. And we've actually just introduced in our 7.13 release, I believe, uh, a new multi-match-like uh, query called combined fields, which is BM25F. So it's a very principled approach to um, doing a multi-field uh, query. And like that's stuff that we're building on top of Lucene. So that's a layer, uh, a layer on top. So I think, I think, yeah, there are definitely differences. Yes, they're the same building blocks underneath. Um, but also with aggregations, you know, for faceting and, and, and uh, uh, things like that, there is a lot on top. And I think a lot of it also comes down to the experience as a you know, search relevance engineer. What does it take to build good search relevance? Um, do you have the right kinds of interfaces? Is it easy to think about making changes? Is it easy to iterate on changes? Um, I think all of those things matter a lot. Uh, and, you know, we haven't talked about evaluation, which is like, don't try doing relevance tuning without doing evaluation as well. Um, and that's not, I think that's the part where, you know, both of us, uh, you know, we have things like the rank evaluation API, um, which can help you do uh, uh, evaluation. But I think actually that's part of the search story that I would argue all three of us could maybe do better at is how do we promote good ways, uh, like good practices for uh, relevance tuning, including uh, good ways to manage relevance data sets, um, doing all of those measurements. There are third party tools to do that, um, but I, you know it's not really part of the, the search engine. Um, yeah, so that's what I'd say. Charlie, you're muted. After 18 yeah. months, I think I've figured out this this remote nonsense. Um, so uh, thank you both. And uh, we have a quick question here for uh, Joe Christian, which is about Vespa. How much is the performance overhead in Vespa if you use classic BM25 retrieval versus dense retrieval-based relevancy ranking? Yeah, so that's, a, that's really a great question. And uh, that's also... Uh, I mean, do you want me to be short on this? Because this is a huge topic, right? Uh, so I'll just go ahead, you know. So there's actually oh, a huge... I'll say shortage. Okay, shortage. So there's a huge debate, actually, in the information retrieval community about um, whether uh, the classic inverted index structure is going to be replaced with dense vector search, right? So because you can do a lot with this, the dense vectors. And one thing is about performance. And if you look at inverted indexes, there's one way you can speed up the evaluation of a BM25. And that is using something called the weak and algorithm. So that's a dynamic pruning algorithm, which basically will look at inverted index and quickly try to figure out, you know, what are the documents that will be highly ranked using just BM25. And Vespa has uh, one implementation, uh, I know Solar, Lucene have a wand implementation. So that's actually one of the research questions that we wanted to answer, you know, if we use replace the wand algorithm and we compare uh, the accuracy, ranking accuracy on MS Marco, and then we use a dense retriever. And actually, I'm going to do, I'm actually writing a blog post on this. It will going to be released uh, next week where we compare 
all these different methods, uh, sparse using wand and using dense. So even including, if you're using the right model, uh, you can actually beat uh, the wand implementation using a dense retriever, also including the query encoding. So taking the query, encoding it through the transformer model, get the vector representation, then do approximate nearest neighbor search, and then basically rank the documents by the, the cosine score or the, uh, yeah, the actual the angular distance or the cosine score, uh, we get higher throughput. And another thing that's important is that nearest neighbor search does not have this kind of um, latency tail. Uh, it's much more friendly if the query is very long uh, and one can struggle if the query is really long. So you can have a, a much higher 99 percentile and, and so on. So actually, if you use the correct transformer model and you can put transformer models into Vespa and have them so you can actually encode the query uh, in Vespa, you don't need to have Python dependencies uh, to run this transformer model. So yeah, so actually uh, in our experience, the actual... Um, uh, the dense retriever can actually outcompete BM25 uh, in, in terms of performance. Okay, so uh, what do we have left? Uh, we're down to our last two questions in the, from the chat, uh, but I've got to I'll see if I can squeeze in what I can squeeze in now. Oh, Josh has dropped in a link for the uh, the wand um, algorithm there, which is great. Thank you, Josh. So uh, let's see. Uh, I. Well, this is a. I'm going to ask you another question, um, Joe, um, very quickly. I can get a quick answer on this one. Okay. Um, let me just see if I can prune this one down. When I think about normal search, Solar and Elasticsearch do come to mind. However, I feel Vespa has positioned itself way too high. It's only being chosen if the use case is high, requirement of machine, lear uh, lang machine learning, language processing. Is Vespa doing this deliberately, or is it just by accident? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure if I uh, if I agree with the, the premise. Uh, I mean, we do have all the classic text ranking functionality, but as we have observed since 2009, I mean, really, search is going through this paradigm shift. So, and we have uh, internal customers, external customers screaming to take these new techniques that really improves ranking. So, yeah, so, but in the blog posts, uh, the thing we write about, you know, we don't write about BM25, right? It's it's there. Uh, so we want to kind of uh, illustrate uh, and, and demonstrate, you know, how you can take these state-of-the-art models and how to how to apply them uh, with Vespa, so. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, I've got a, a couple of questions just to round us off. Hopefully, we'll take us to the end of the session. We're finishing at, at half past the hour, and then there'll be a closing address from uh, Nina and the Berlin Buswiss team, so do hang around for that. So um, I'm just going to go around all three of you uh, here and um, ask, firstly, um, this is an odd one. If there was a feature of your search engine you could remove tomorrow, which would it be? Josh. Uh, that's really hard. Um, I mean, we remove things uh, maybe to uh, people's uh, frustration. We, we remove things pretty regularly from Elasticsearch. Uh, I remember Doug Turnbull a few weeks ago was complaining about something that we removed or deprecated at least. Um, if I had to pick something, I mean, I mentioned the first thing that comes to mind. I mentioned um, combined fields, uh, which is BM25F, a, a very principled way to do multi field searching. It's kind of replacing, not quite replacing. Oh, I'm going to get flack for this. Um, I would say I would remove cross fields, uh, which is a multi match uh, query type. Um, I think people struggle to understand what it's doing. Uh, so there's like best fields, which is taking a field. Uh, field-centric view of, of search, and then there's cross fields, which takes the term-centric view. So it's like putting all of your fields together, kind of. I think combined fields is a much more principled approach um, to the term-centric view. So I would remove cross fields. Okay. And I'm gonna let's see who gets angry. I, I, I have a feeling that won't be universally popular. But hey, let's generate some controversy. Um, Anshan, what about you? What, what what would you what would you kill off from Solar if you if you could? 
That's a really tough one. Um, I'm going to give an umbrella answer and then I'm going to sp specify a specific thing. Uh, the general answer is solar is just because it's a community driven project has multiple ways of accomplishing the exact same thing with varying implementations, let me tell you. Like it's not necessarily the same implementation either. So I would personally like to reduce things to be done in one way if you wanted to accomplish one thing. So it wouldn't be one thing, it would be a bunch of things that are just duplicates of each other in terms of functionality that they offer. And the one thing that I'd, and we've discussed this among the committers a million times now, is, is, um, is reducing the one way of faceting in solar. And that's existed forever now. Uh, there's the JSON facets and there's the traditional facets. Uh, one of them approximates, the other one doesn't. Uh, users don't generally really know what's the difference between the both of them. And so they stick with whatever they feel is an easier query DSL, let me put it that way. So either that or which one's faster, not knowing what are the repercussions of using one over the other. So if there could be one way of accomplishing or getting facets out of their data sets, uh, that would be so good for them, for them to just concentrate on doing one thing one way. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Joe Christie, if you've been doing this since 2003, there must be one bit of Vespa that you just think this just shouldn't be here. Please can we just print it out? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's a really hard question. So there are some, uh, some internal, uh, which is not really impacting the external API. On the external API, I would like to remove some of the text matching uh, rank features. Uh, so there's there's a bunch of them, uh, the whole list of text ranking features, you know, that users can be a little bit overwhelmed uh, compared to BM25. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of user facing feature that some of the, I think we could maybe cut down uh, a little bit on, on those. Great, thank you. I know it's a hard one, uh, but I think from my experience and, and you know, a long time ago, sadly now, maintaining some of these big systems, there's always a bit that just makes you think, oh, I'll just comment it out and maybe nobody will notice. So um, our last question here, um, I'm gonna ask, uh, again, I'm gonna go around and ask you all, uh, what's your favorite coming soon feature, something you know is coming down the pipe, maybe it's not quite ready yet. Um, and what do you think is going to, it, 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 that's hopefully going to make a big impact and, and why do you think it's so great? So I'm going to start that off. Um, I think probably I'll start with you, Josh, on that one. What do you know that's coming down the pipe that you think is going to be really great for Elasticsearch? Uh, I mean, I mentioned both the and the machine. Uh, so that's in the scene. So I yeah, people know about that. I think PyTorch integration. Uh, I think I mean it's something that customers have been asking for for a long time. Uh, it's going to enable a significant number of um, search use cases from you know ranking, dense retrieval. Um, but we have a lot of customers that also uh, do NLP on ingest to uh, uh, extract structure out of unstructured text. Um, and I think, be, you know, being able to just do NLP tasks at ingest time, um, you know, anything from sentiment analysis to NER, um, you know, zero shot classification, I think this could be hugely powerful for uh, search customers and, you know, maybe, let's say non-traditional uh, search customers, so people building, you know, search for uh, customer service records or things like that. Like these are really common uh, tasks that people have to do. And they, today they have to do it outside of Stack. Um, and the PyTorch integration will bring uh, not only inference, but like a complete model management solution. So it's about uploading a model, um, saying, you know, the type of, of uh, cluster that you want, and you know, we take care of, of the rest of that. So uh, to me, that's, I mean, I'm a bit biased. That's one of my projects <laughs> that I work on. So uh, I'm definitely biased. But um, uh, to me, that's probably the biggest one up and coming. Okay, so what about you, Joe Christian? What's coming next? Yeah, there's uh, there's one a couple. <laughs> one thing. One thing. One thing. 
Uh, that's hard. Uh, yeah, there, there's going to be some significant. Um, I mean, we are already have really fast indexing. There's going to be some significant improvements uh, on indexing throughput. Uh, so that's especially around partial updates. Uh, so we currently have 50,000 updates per second per node. Um, I've seen some really nice numbers uh, coming out from the core team. So that's one feature that I'm really excited about pushing. Uh, the performance uh, of of, of Vespa. Okay, and uh, Anshul, what about you? What's uh, what do you think is coming down the pipe? What's your favorite new thing on the way? Well, Josh has allowed me to be biased towards something that I've been I've been looking at. So um, I think the cross DC for Solar, which has been there for Solar but never really worked uh, successfully. Um, the new design for that uh, is something that's loosely based on the work that we've been using at my workplace. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that, that uses a messaging queue in the middle to, to achieve cross data center replication um, and multi-way. Uh, that's really exciting. Uh, that allows people to use solar as a, like allows solar to be HA and DR ready is just uh, something super exciting to me. Fantastic, thank you. Well, that's great to hear. And it's it's great to hear you're all you're all um, still excited about what's coming uh, what's coming later. Uh, Joe Christen has asked in, internally in our in our little chat here. He's asked about when, when Python's going to become integrated into Elasticsearch. So uh, it's uh, I, it's it's not PyTorch as in Python PyTorch. It's TorchScript. So it's a uh, native. Uh, it'll be a native process. I see. So not not, not quite so, Python built into Elastic. You can't. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, let's see if we've got one time for one last question. Um, uh, th there's a complicated one here. I'm not sure I can ask in the time, but uh, Joe, I'm going to ask you one last question and get the last word on this. Uh, you mentioned pre-trained models in vector search libraries won't generalize well to other domains. Does this not apply to Vesper as well? I, I think the answer is yes. It also it's just a general problem, isn't it? Yes. So this is this is a general problem. Uh, we have a blog series right now about uh, using transformers for ranking. So I've uh, written three posts already, and the fourth one is coming, uh, where we lay out the challenges of uh, predefined uh, or pre-trained models. And but in domain, uh, they work brilliant. Uh, beats BM25 by a large margin. So there's no doubt that. You know, this is going to be uh, something that's going to stick. Uh, but using a model and just drop it to some other domain, uh, we're not selling that, right? You need to have uh, the ability to train a model for your domain. And that's independent if you're using Vespa or Fice directly or Vaviet or Gina or any of the other vector search libraries. OK. Right, well, we've come to the end of our search engine debate and i do hope you've enjoyed it um we've got through a lot i think and i'm hoping this is going to be a once the, the video is released uh by the amazing team here at buzzwords it's going to be a, a, a keeper i think um so i've got a few um a, a few uh things to say so firstly i'd just like to thank uh, joe christian burgum josh devins national gupta for standing up yet again for uh, Vespa, Elasticsearch, and Solar, respectively, and to everyone who asked a question um, and supplied us the questions, I think you can agree it's been a great session. 